I have two extraordinary young entrepreneurs, Simon Yu, co-founder and COO of Clubhouse Media Group, and his co-founder there, president of the Clubhouse Media Group, Christian Young. Welcome to the playbook, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This is super exciting. So I'm going to start with the obvious question, because I know there's been a lot in the media, no pun intended, with Clubhouse Media, about the confusion in the marketplace between Clubhouse, the app, and Clubhouse Media Group. I'm going to start with what effect did Clubhouse, the app, have on your company? Do you want me to take that or you want to take that one, Simon? <laughs> I, I mean, I look, I, I think there is, um, I guess, rumors or, or something along the lines of, you know, Elon Musk liking or tweeting one of our posts. And, you know, my question to that is, yeah, it could be that he mistakenly mis- mistaken us for the Clubhouse app. Or, you know, does Elon make mistakes, you know? So I don't know, you know, Chris, what do you think? Um, you know, from what I hear, and, and I'm, I'm about one step away from, from Elon for a few people, um, uh, my conclusion of it really was Elon doesn't mistake, make mistakes. So I guess, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, he, as a person, I think he, he, he likes he doesn't like authority. <laughs> I think we know that. <laughs> uh, and two is I think, uh, I think he, he kind of likes the underdog. So, uh, but number three is maybe he didn't make a mistake. So who knows? And either way, it doesn't matter because your business has to be able to articulate its quantitative value, which you guys do so well. Um, why don't, as a co-founder, you know, one of you give me a little bit of background on how, not only has the idea evolved, but how you've executed on the idea. Yeah, I, I think um, I can jump in a little bit. Uh, Chris at the time was uh, was a counsel for one of the club Hype House members, Daisy Keach at the time, and him and Amir hooked up and, you know, they were talking about starting their own content house. And, you know, Chris let me know that, you know, that's what he was doing. And I said, Chris, you know, it wouldn't be interesting to have a publicly traded company around social media. And, you know, well, part of being a publicly traded company is awareness and having that aspect is a very interesting idea. So I think we're going to kind of just slowly put things together. And, you know, we started our first house. When did we start our first house, Chris? Do you remember? Uh, we signed the lease in the middle of March, I think, and uh, officially opened in April. And then I would say the business really started in around June because there was a lot of pre-planning. Uh, uh, but we we knew at that time that COVID was coming and things were going to get shut down. So we said, let's let's lock this in and let's get it set up. So, and you know, without fear, you guys got to set it up during COVID. Um, and with that, where do you see um, the value in? Is it in the influencers or the products or the combination thereof? Uh, of what it's, you're able to do. It's a combination. So, um, so my background has been, uh, I was in uh, EIR uh, over at Lampos Group, and I was also uh, an advisor um, and an investor with Amplify uh, here in Venice. So, uh, and prior to that, I was an e-commerce operator two times. Uh, and so I had seen influencers in the space and worked with them on, uh, on all aspects and fronts for probably the last 12 years, 11 years or so. Um, and I knew the power and impact that they had um, from a marketing perspective, uh, from a branding perspective. And, and, and I saw the trajectory for, for over a decade of where it was going. That was tra- uh, traditional media was getting disintermediated and, and, and changed out from this new media. So I had always wanted to work in that field. I had been in it in many ways. Um, but I also, uh, wanted to combine something, you know, uh, with the experience that I had that, you know, obviously Simon has as well. Um, and we wanted to create something that was sort of, uh, a mixture of, of in some ways venture, uh, and, uh, and social media. So really what we have is, um, is, uh, is an investment vehicle in a way that can, that can develop and operate, uh, companies, uh, but with the large marketing reach of social media influencers. And, you know, there's so much, I think, misunderstanding. You know, I've been mentoring a lot of people in your space. I know you guys know Dan Fleischman, um, Mm -hmm. that for years. And the irony of my life is when 
this whole space started and I was mentoring guys like Dan about the space, I was still marketing traditional brands, you know, the Troy Aikman's, Warren Moon's of the world uh, in the traditional sense, trying to uh, reconcile how influencers uh, would appeal to the traditional people. And, you know, I think one of the best examples of the differentiators in what you do is that somebody like Dr. Pimple Popper can have more of a social media influence than the entire Pro Football Hall of Fame uh, combined. Uh, And understanding how that impacts brands is essential because the large brands that you guys deal with, you know, health and beauty brands that have been around uh, for centuries, not even decades, and the billions of dollars in marketing that are poured in and through them, uh, their systems don't reconcile uh, with the data analytics and the understanding of, you know, a Jenner or even worse of a micro influencer. So what have you guys been doing because you have such success with bigger brands to educate the traditional marketing and media business units that exist within the bigger brands and how has that evolved over all these years and where are we going to go next with these bigger brands? Um, I believe that the bigger brands, it's funny, this, I was asked the exact same question a few hours earlier, um, uh, when I was, um, being interviewed with, uh, another, another, uh, <laughs> um, I just, gotta tell, I just gotta tell you, Chris, that my, my goal is always for people to tell me the exact opposite. No one's okay. ever asked me that question, but this, I know, this is the I first know. for me. <laughs> someone just asked me this question. Look, I'm, I'm someone who illuminates the truth. So you, yeah. you didn't hurt my feelings, but uh, hopefully you have a really good answer now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hopefully have a better answer than I did earlier today. <laughs> uh, my answer earlier today was, was I honestly don't know. And, and, and I'd be, and I'd be an idiot to say that I do, but uh, this is what I, what I currently believe in. And what I see is that micro and nano influencers are definitely the way of the future. Um, and aggregation of them is going to be really important in my opinion. Um, and at least from an ROI standpoint, it makes more sense for brands to work with them. Uh, from an awareness standpoint, though, and awareness is very important, right? Because you have to d- dissect what your social marketing looks like. You have social awareness and social performance marketing. Social performance marketing is probably best suited for macro and nanos. Uh, sorry, uh, nanos and micros. Macro influencers are best suited more for, for awareness marketing. Uh, top of mind, mind share, that type of stuff, but not true ROI. What we've done uh, is we actually acquired a software company, one that I had uh, invested in um, called Magiclytics. Uh, it was something that we had developed uh, out of Amplify um, when we saw uh, our portfolio of companies was using influencers in all sorts of ways. Uh, and it was a problem that I had seen for, like I said, uh, probably a, a close to a decade now was how do you identify what are you going to get out of a campaign with an influencer? Like, what is the ROI on it? You, you could spend you know, upwards of a quarter million, half a million, a uh, million dollars, you know, uh, for one influencer to, to post a picture. And you may see three sales. So, you know, you might see a lot of exposure to your brand. But um, so we developed a piece of software called Magiclytics that has around a 70% success rate right now of identifying before a first dollar spent, which influencer to use, how much you're going to make. And it currently works in the e-commerce space. That's awesome. So, you know, one of the other areas, I think the analogy that I used to use between engagement and awareness understanding micro and nano influencers compared to the macro celebrity influencers that exist with huge followings uh, would be the difference between, you know, um, a commercial on the Super Bowl, which is great awareness compared to putting your product on QVC, which is great engagement and has, you know, that direct capability. And I see that the micro and nano influencers have a very tight influence and engagement with their audiences. Uh, and the macro influencers are like a Super Bowl commercial where you know they give a maximum exposure. I think what's interesting to me is there's a lot of, you know, I'll use like Selena Gomez as an example because I like to joke around with her. I think she has like 130 million followers, but she can't sell out a movie theater, right? Like my, <laughs> my, my two minute drill does better than her movies. 
And, you know, I have, you know, a, a nano audience of a half a million people uh, on my Instagram compared to hers. Right. But with the amazing person that is just, you know, to me, an anomaly is Kylie Jenner uh, because she has an extraordinarily large following, but also she sells. You know, she literally, she sells products and that's why she's, you know, one of the first women billionaires uh, as an influencer. Um, what do you think it is about Kylie Jenner that gives her the crossover of not only being a macro influencer of great awareness, but can actually engage your audience where they'll go out and shop for what she says to shop for? Yeah. So, you know, in my opinion, um, when you're talking about, you know, Kylie Jenner, you're really not just talking about Kylie Jenner. You're talking about the entire family. You're talking about the Kardashians, the Jenners. What you're talking about is really an aggregate uh, of a lot of things together. So I think that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon and probably, you know, uh, a case study in itself. But um, but it really isn't just one person. So you're actually just talking, you're, you're talking about the entire family, really. Um and, and the association between that, um, I think is massive. And I think people discount the fact they, they, they point to one person, you know, Kylie Jenner, but in truth, it's, it, it's, it's the, it's that whole, it's, it's their family. Uh, it may even extend to, you know, their friends. And so I think, uh, if you equate that to what we're doing and, and we're aggregating as well, a lot of macro influencers and, and their ability to, to do that. So, um, now back to what you were first saying, uh, the first part of your sentence, um, you're right with, with, with nanos, um, it's very interesting because, uh, and you're not a nano, by the way, at half a million, that is <laughs> not a nano influence. A nano influence is like 2000 or, you know, a thousand or something. Uh, those are just the people, you know, that you legitimately know that you probably are, you know, uh, and let's make it even tinier. Let's do just like micro, uh, I don't even know what you would call it at that point. Like m micro nano influencer. Like, uh, if you and I, if all of us were just sitting together having lunch and I said, Hey, this salad, I had it before. It's great. You should get it. And the two of you say, yeah, let's order. Or th sorry, three of you, you know, say, yeah, let's, let's order this salad. I have just influenced you into getting that, right? And so at the end of the day, that's all it really is when you talk about influencers and all this. It's, it's just, it's a recommendation. Um, now, I think we're, where the, you know, Kylie Jenner works, not only is it because of the aggregate of the entire family, but I also think she does speak really well with her audience and her, and there's a difference between fandom and followers, you know, a fan and a follower, two completely different things. And she has a lot of fandom. Yeah. No, Simon. I, I think part of it is also is like, like Chris said, is that it's their success of opening up their lives and everyone who, who wants to be like them or be, be them, you know, and it's like us growing up in the eighties and nineties, we all wanted to be like Michael Jordan, you know? And I, I think it's the same way for, you know, um, her fans, you know, her, her life was so wide open for the past 10, 15 years. And everyone has kind of, kind of associated them with as part of the family. And so that's how I think it's a very different sell than Selena Gomez, you know? Yeah. No, no, no Simon, you're the COO of the company and, you know, it's one thing to talk about the marketing and media. It's another thing to run and build a company and have the right acquisitions and build a platform. What are the key components that you see for your business uh, that's going to be a distinguishing factor where already, you know, with Magilytics, you can, you know, put some sort of parameter around the value of an influencer and who to aggregate, who not to aggregate, who to hire, who not to hire. But you know, this is such an unfathomably big opportunity. Uh, we don't, I don't think, have the capability yet to see how much opportunity and how capable we are of, you know, taking advantage of it. But as a COO, I bet you must be overwhelmed every day kind of thinking, all right, what's the next piece of the puzzle? Uh, you know, number one, what is the next piece of your puzzle? And two, how do you decide on it? It's funny because that's a, a constant daily battle of, you know, trying to grow the company and we're, we're trying to go through it mergers and acquisitions at the same time, trying to add the correct pieces to scale. Right. We don't want to run into a situation where we scale too quickly and we don't have the pieces in place to support the acquisitions or the expansion plans. And so it's, it's really a juggling act, you know, you got to 
add one piece and then scale, add one piece and scale, you know, it's just take it day by day. And what advice, I'm going to finish up with this. What advice would both of you give to the brands that are completely confused today, paralyzed today, afraid to spend money because they feel as if they have no idea if anyone knows what they're doing. What advice would you give a brand today that's looking for sales? They want to use, you know, the marketing and influencers to sell product. What advice would you give them? Simon, you can go first. Uh, I, I think the one, one key thing is use magic lytics. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think a lot, a lot of this marketing that we've seen is, is kind of, you know, we, you know, these brands put money into it and they hope that they get an ROI on it. And I, I, you know, I know we're tooting our own horn is, but you know, that's what magic lytics solves is just kind of give them a guideline or a roadmap of what could possibly happen if they spend this kind of money. Uh, large or small, or which influencers to actually focus on or not focus on. So uh, I think that's probably one of my biggest advice is once we had the platform out, just sign up. Nice. Chris, anything to add to that wisdom? <laughs> I can't, I can't. <laughs> um... <laughs> Chris and I went to the same college. So I have to give everybody some crap on the show today. Cause I'm like <laughs> alumni, I've set these uh, uh, two up for success. I gave Simon the biggest softball and now Chris is trapped. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what, uh, I'm going to take it in a different route. Uh, I'm going to say, focus on your product first, because, um, you know, uh, I was on, you know, on the other side of the table as a venture capitalist for a, a long time. And, uh, and everything I, I taught all my companies, our portfolio companies, and, and as an advisor is focus on your product. You know, you have the right product. Uh, well, first of all, have you identified the problem? Is the problem real? Is your solution really a good solution? Is the product market fit right? And if you have a great product, it honestly will sell itself. Um, then you take it to scale, you know, but focus on the product because the best products, and, and, I, and I use this, this is my analogy. Uh, I go why, why was toilet paper invented? Well, because a leaf really hurts, right? <laughs> and then and let's go a little, we, go we, we all, for we all almost found out how much it really hurts just with yeah. the pandemic. So yes, I imagine yeah. I, I save my socks from now on. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's a product market fit, right? And then you go one step further you say, well, toilet paper doesn't really fully solve a problem. Why do we have bidets nowadays? Like that are across in, in the U.S. not so much, but across pretty much the rest of the world, you know. So, um, a good product um, is just is really you know the first thing I think most entrepreneurs and brands uh, need to focus on. Uh, now, if you're going to really talk about uh, social media marketing, I think it's important for them to find um, uh, influencers that actually resonate with their products. There are so many times where I've seen brands send something to some of our creators that have you know tens of millions in following. And they're not getting paid a dime, but they just love the product. And that, that goes back to what I was saying earlier. The product is great and they will go and post it and talk about it for free just because they love it. Right. And, um, I, and I would, I'd say also is just the audience for the product. Right. And, you know, we've seen products go to our influencers and they don't get no traction, but when we go do a deep dive, you know, it's a totally different demographic than our influencer used to you know, their audiences, you know, you're talking about young female, you know, 16 to 30, and the, this product's for you know, men or males, 45 to 60, you know, and it just doesn't resonate with their audience. So it's just really understanding who that idea consumer is and marketing towards that. And going with Chris saying is that also finding those influencers that are targeted for that audience as well. I agree completely. You have the strength of the signals created by the frequency of the product or the content. You know, I deal with a lot of content creators and I always say, look, it wouldn't matter because your content doesn't get there, right? And then there's other people that it doesn't matter because their content's so good. That creates the strength of the signal. And then you guys help find that spectrum of the audience that can receive that frequency or that signal. And then we can all help clarify the message uh, the more that they uh, post or, or share. Uh, that will clarify the message even further. But I think those are the three components uh, that Clubhouse Media uh, really assists with is really identifying the right products with the right influencers in the spectrum and a clear message in order to create the success that you want in what seems to be a very arbitrary and capricious 
uh, state of media. You guys provide stable data uh, that allows for better prospecting uh, to distribute it into market, which I think is extraordinary. I know it's not easy to do, uh, especially with the great minds of Cal State Fullerton and Occidental that we have here. It's not easy to do a three-person, three-legged podcast, but you guys were awesome. I appreciate you. Simon Yu, uh, CEO of Clubhouse Media Group with Christian Young, the president of Clubhouse Media Group. Thank you so much for joining me, David Meltzer, here on Entrepreneurs, The Playbook. <laughs> <laughs>